Well, thank you very much for all joining here uh, to, to hear uh, Chairman Janikowski's uh, speech about broadband and, and innovation. Uh, first, I would like to uh, say thank you to, to Chairman Janikowski for allowing uh, us to put on this event here. Uh, we're very, very excited to be, to be talking about uh, uh, these topics and how they can help us to, to push forward. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing him for, for several years, and, and uh, I've been very excited about the initiatives that he has been, uh, been pushing. Uh, in addition, we have Warren Brown, uh, who is the, the owner and founder of Cake Love, which is a Washington, D.C. area business uh, that has seven locations throughout the metro area. Uh, we have also been able to work with Cake Love uh, on three separate occasions and drive them uh, tens of thousands of customers and hundreds of, of thousands of dollars of revenue uh, over the course of our business. Uh, and really, I think they're a great example of how we can work together to, to spur uh, new growth for, for local businesses by leveraging technology and really driving people from the online world uh, into, into the offline world. Uh, and, and once again, also thank you to those that are watching from a webcast, uh, and uh, both on, the, on TV and streaming, uh, for joining us as well. Um, so I'd like to speak for just a moment about Living Social and the roots of, of what it has. Uh, the company has been around for over four years at this point in time. Uh, we started, like every business, as a small business in and of ourselves. And we've been able to, uh, to fortunately grow uh, to uh, nearly 4,000 employees worldwide, uh, of which about 2,000 or so are, are in the U.S. Uh, we have uh, over 40 million members, uh, and we're live in 589 uh, markets worldwide, uh, really helping to drive local commerce on a global uh, and, and international scale. Uh, we, all, we also are continuing to go and hire at the rate of uh, between 150 and 200 employees per month, and we think that we have a, a model that will continue to grow and drive uh, gr job growth and innovation uh, throughout the U.S. and worldwide. Um, we, what we do is we help small businesses uh, attract and retain new customers, uh, which is the number one problem for many small businesses out there, which is how do I get new customers through my door? Uh, and so this evolution of local commerce, which is being fueled by, uh, by innovations in broadband and growth, is, is really what Living Social is driving towards. Um, not only are we a growing enterprise, but we think that we have the capability to allow lots of small businesses to, to grow in conjunction with us. Uh, much of our growth in the future relies on having a, a local, real-time mobile economy, and that the local device or the mobile device becomes a local interaction machine for both consumers and small businesses that are out there. So I'm very, very excited for uh, everything that we're uh, able to do and, and how the, the country and the technology industry can continue to push ahead uh, to drive growth uh, uh, that really has impacts for in, in the real world with local businesses uh, and local jobs that are out there. Um, so, so with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Warren Brown to, to go and talk a little bit about Cake Love and, and everything that it's, uh, it's done for him. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I want to say thank you very much, everyone at Living Social, because we just had a really successful run last week with 7,500 vouchers sold uh, last Tuesday and Wednesday. So it was a great sale for us, and we're very thankful for that. Um, Cake Love is my bakery, founded in 2002, and it has seven different locations throughout the D.C. area. Um, we bake on site and have retail storefronts uh, that people come into, and place orders either in person, but we get a lot of our sales online through our online store, and we do really a lot of our business, communication, uh, online processing of bills, you know, through the computer and with broadband. It's essential for us as a business to continue and to run and operate efficiently and with low cost by using uh, broadband services. I can remember when we first started uh, back in 2002, um, you know, dial-up was the way I had to use the computer and go online, and it just took so much time to get everything done that uh, I wasn't able to grow the business in an efficient way, you know, in any way. I mean, sometimes processing payroll took four hours. And I know it sounds crazy, but it did, and I only had like 13 or 14 people. Um, so now things are thankfully much faster, and it really has to do with just the ability to jump online and do what we need to do and do what I need to do in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I think the internet's very important for us to be able to market as well uh, through Living Social, through social media, of course, like Facebook and Twitter. Um, but, you know, it's also just a matter of 
being able to stream music in the shop so that staff feel happy and satisfied. They got something to listen to. Um, being able to communicate via email with all my different staff about things that are changing on a daily basis, just to keep up with orders and to keep up with operations. So for us, broadband is an essential tool, just as important as the phone, just as important as the mixer, just as important as the cash register. And uh, we rely on it every day. And for me, the faster it is and the more reliable it is at each of the shops, the more I'm able to grow my business. Uh, so that's really all I have. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Chairman Chudikowski and um, welcome his remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Tim and Warren. Um, I'm going to speak for a few minutes, but the truth is you two just summed up uh, everything I'm here to say. I thank you for taking the time, Warren, for being here, Tim, for opening up your doors at Living Social. Congratulations to both of you on your remarkable success. Uh, um, it's been uh, barely two years since Living Social offered, offered its first deal for a restaurant uh, here in D.C.'s Chinatown. Uh, I had a chance to see Tim get started even earlier. Uh, in a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of employees you have now. Since then, Living Social has expanded to 550 markets and attracted more than 40 million subscribers. You've created a product of real value to consumers and to businesses, particularly small businesses, helping them expand their sales, lower their costs, and put people to work. And Living Social itself has created nearly 2,000 American jobs in just the last couple of years. It's no accident that I'm giving this speech here. For starters, we got an unbelievable uh, deal on the room rental. <laughs> but of course, the bigger reason I'm here is that Living Social story is part of a larger story. It's the same story we just heard from Warren Brown, who's using Living Social and wired and wireless online tools to expand his Cake Love Bakery from one store to seven, even in this tough economy, delighting more and more customers and hiring more and more people. It's the story of Detroit, where energetic entrepreneurs are turning auto parts warehouses into tech centers and business incubators. And uh, the Lions aren't the only comeback story. It's the story of Blue Valley Meats, a small business I visited in Diller, Nebraska, that's nearly tripled its workforce thanks to e-commerce. It's the story of broadband, high-speed internet, wired and wireless, and how it's transforming our economy and the way we live, creating jobs in large numbers, boosting opportunity all over the country, and driving our global competitiveness. For two years in this job, I've been speaking about how broadband is indispensable infrastructure for America in the 21st century. I haven't been alone on this. Each of my colleagues on the Federal Communications Commission has done the same. And together, we've refocused the agency on broadband and accomplished a great deal to help drive our broadband economy. Today, I'd like to address a few topics. First, why broadband is so vital to our near-term economic recovery and long-term prosperity. Second, how positive developments in the broadband economy give us strong reason for optimism about our economic future. And third, what we must do to expand broadband access and adoption and ensure that America has broadband infrastructure that spurs world-leading innovation, economic growth, and job creation. We are at a pivotal moment in our country's history. Our nation faces tremendous economic challenges. Millions of Americans are struggling. More than half of U.S. families include someone who has been unemployed during this downturn. New technologies and a hyper-connected, flat world mean that some categories of 20th century jobs are unlikely ever to return to previous levels. It's understandable that many Americans worry about our country's future, worry that it won't be as bright as our past. But it's also true that the U.S. broadband economy is strong and growing, opening doors to new opportunity every day. Innovation in wireless and wired broadband is thriving and Private investment in Internet applications and infrastructure is on the rise. New broadband-enabled industries, and with them new jobs, are opening their doors every day 
in growing numbers on mobile platforms as well as in homes and businesses, in schools and hospitals. Broadband is a bright spot in our overall economy and helps light a path to broad economic health and widespread opportunity. That broadband internet is transforming our world is something Living Social knows well because you are on the cutting edge. Facebook, Twitter, iPhone, tablets, app stores, Android, Kindle, the cloud. Just five years ago, these things either didn't exist or we'd never heard of them. Now it's hard to imagine life or business without them. They are fundamentally American innovations invented here, rolled out here, and being sported from here to the rest of the world. These and many of the world's most exciting new products and services built on today's high-speed communications infrastructure bear the stamp innovated in the USA. And there's far more innovation ahead of us than behind. Moving forward, we won't just be talking into our devices. They'll increasingly be talking to each other. With machine-to-machine -machine technologies, cars, for example, will be equipped with sensors that can automatically take evasive action to avoid accidents. When an accident causes major traffic delays, your alarm clock will be notified to wake you up early so you'll get to work on time. Your dishwasher will run when it's most efficient and least costly. People with chronic diseases will have wireless devices that notify doctors about a sudden change in condition. The changes being ushered in by high-speed Internet are at least as promising as those brought about by electricity. Instead of appliances on the electric grid, it's now applications on the information grid. Tom Friedman and Michael Mandelbaum recently wrote, we are at the most profound inflection point for communications innovation and commerce since the Gutenberg printing press. Our ability to meet this moment and seize the opportunities of this new communications technology is critical to our economic recovery and our economic future. One reason I'm confident about our future is that as Friedman and Mandelbaum say in their book, America has a proven formula for adapting to change and growing our economy. They call this formula the five pillars of American prosperity, world-leading education, immigration policies that invite the world's best and brightest, investment in basic scientific research and development, laws that encourage entrepreneurship while safeguarding consumers, and the building and continual modernizing of our infrastructure. These pillars are interrelated. Improving infrastructure supports education and entrepreneurship, and vice versa. Infrastructure, innovation, and economic success have always been tied together in the U.S. Railroads and highways connected people to each other, facilitating commerce, unleashing ingenuity, and fueling economic growth. Telephones did the same. We didn't get here by chance. We got here by choice. In their time, those elements of infrastructure formed the connective tissue of a modernizing economy. Today, it's broadband internet. Our broadband infra infrastructure consists of the fiber, the cables, the cell towers, and airwaves that enable digital internet traffic to travel anywhere in the world in a fraction of a second. Eight trillion dollars are exchanged over these wired and wireless networks each year. If you shut down the internet, you'd shut down the economy. The information technology and communication sector represents a sixth of our economy in the U.S. and growing and a greater percentage of our job creation. Over the past 15 years, even taking into account the recent difficult economic times, the Internet has enabled as much economic growth as the Industrial Revolution generated in its first 50 years. In the U.S., the Internet accounted for 8% of America's GDP growth from 1995 to 2009. Since 2004, it's accounted for 15% of U.S. GDP growth, so the Internet is only growing in importance. Since World War II, technological innovation has res been responsible for more than half of our economic growth. In the digital age, broadband is our innovation infrastructure. Broadband allows innovation to come from anyone, anywhere, from the tinkerer in the garage to the kid in the dorm room. Broadband empowers individual innovators and also creates a previously unimaginable ability to engage in collaboration which, as Stephen Johnson has shown, is the way many breakthrough inventions come about. And broadband substantially boosts productivity, a key driver of sustainable economic growth. Cloud computing is about to take the productivity-enhancing benefits of the broadband Internet to the next level. Now, I recognize that the positive link 
between innovation, productivity, and job creation can sometimes seem counterintuitive. The disruptive impact of high-speed internet is as undeniable as the lost jobs at video stores, newspapers, or yellow pages. But the key fact is that the internet is creating more jobs than it's eliminating. McKinsey recently concluded that broadband internet creates 2.6 jobs for everyone lost. That's a statistic worth repeating. 2.6 jobs created for everyone lost. These are real jobs being created right now. Companies like Amazon, Apple, and Google have been adding jobs by the thousands. Newer businesses like LinkedIn and Twitter are growing jobs at an even faster pace and at the same time promoting broader job growth by offering services that are helping people and businesses market themselves and connect with others. A recent study by University of Maryland researchers put some numbers around the job creation leverage of Internet companies. Facebook employs 2,600 people, a big number standing alone. The researchers concluded that counting the developers building applications for the Facebook platform, Facebook has been responsible for the creation of 182,000 jobs. Many of these jobs are software and other engineering jobs. And that's great, because we won't succeed in the hyper-connected, hyper-competitive 21st century economy if we're not educating, attracting, and employing world-class engineers. But as important, many jobs being created by the broadband economy are not engineering jobs and are not just in Silicon Valley and other tech centers. Broadband is enabling job creation at different skill levels and all over the country. Living social is proof of this. Yes, you've got great engineers. And in just the last three years, Living Social, Groupon, and others in this space have created over 3,000 street-level sales jobs in the U.S. in more than 200 different local markets and growing. And your products are helping bricks and mortars businesses grow, including many small businesses. This is another point that's too often overlooked. The way in which broadband internet is a catalyst for small business opportunity, helping local small businesses grow and prosper all over the country. Consider eBay and Amazon. They employ nearly 50,000 people directly. Again, that's great. It's a small percentage of the small business jobs they are facilitating. More than one million entrepreneurs and growing a large percentage of which are small businesses are selling products on these platforms, generating revenue that helps them hire and pay their employees. And new platforms are developing to help entrepreneurs sell their goods, like Etsy, a platform, in its words, for very, very small businesses that's already generating $400 million in annual sales. Just last month in Jeffersonville, Indiana, I joined a coalition of companies called Jobs for America to announce the creation of 100,000 new broadband-enabled call center jobs in the U.S. over the next two years, all over the country, many onshored from overseas. Many of these are at-home jobs that create meaningful um, employment opportunities for people with disabilities, veterans, seniors, and stay-at-home parents. Pioneers like LiveOps have for years had the vision to use broadband to defy old barriers of location and create at-home jobs for people with disabilities and others. Last month, when announcing a 1,000 new at-home jobs at his company, Accent Marketing CEO's Tim Searcy said point blank, broadband makes all of this possible. It's reassuring to know that the Internet is creating jobs at a faster rate than it's displacing them, but there are no guarantees about where those new jobs will be created in the global economy. The world is connected. Capital can flow anywhere and jobs will follow. Let's not kid ourselves. I hear this directly from my counterparts overseas. Our global competitors want to be centers of broadband innovation and job creation in the 21st century, and they're focused on it. To make sure that the U.S. is getting a full and growing share of broadband-enabled jobs, we've got to get our broadband infrastructure right. If we don't, we'll still have job losses here, but the new jobs will increasingly be created in other parts of the world. 
To be clear, a robust broadband infrastructure won't alone guarantee that the U.S. remains the world's economic leader. Fiscal and housing challenges must be addressed, and our education system must be improved. But neglecting our broadband infrastructure will guarantee that we lose ground in the 21st century economy. And taking the right steps on broadband can generate jobs and economic growth even as the country tackles other issues. Fortunately, we're well positioned to lead in the global broadband economy. The U.S. captures 30% of all internet revenue worldwide and more than 40% of net income. We lead in broadband innovation overall and we've regained the lead in mobile a fast-growing and critically important sector. We have the highest number of 3G subscribers, and thanks to successful FCC auctions and a digital TV transition completed successfully in 2009, we freed up spectrum for mobile broadband and are ahead of the world in deploying next-generation 4G networks that will offer speeds we're accustomed to on wireline networks. Our apps economy is the envy of the world. With U.S. software developers leading the way, there are now more than 500,000 mobile apps available, and app sales are projected to approach $38 billion by 2015. Remember, it wasn't that long ago when the mobile apps economy didn't exist at all. Mobile, local, real-time are each big trends, creating jobs and opportunity here now with huge potential for the future. The U.S. is also the first to free up unlicensed white spaces spectrum. The FCC's order last year represented the largest release in 25 years of unlicensed spectrum and the first release of high-powered unlicensed spectrum, a powerful new platform for innovation. Earlier this month, we took another step forward, announcing the testing of the first White Spaces database. U.S. companies will have a head start in developing new devices, apps, and services for this spectrum, super Wi-Fi, machine-to-machine, and more, and will be in a position to export to the world and help grow our economy here. The promise of the broadband economy today is reflected by the private investment it's attracting. Despite the slow economy, private investment is increasing substantially in both broadband infrastructure and in companies at the edge of the broadband networks. Broadband providers invested tens of billions of dollars in wired and wireless networks in the first half of 2011, a double-digit increase from 2010. Capital investment at large tech companies is also robust in the tens of billions of dollars and experiencing very healthy increases. Venture capital investment in Internet startups has returned to its highest level since 2001, attracting more than $2 billion in the most recent quarter. A new Deloitte study estimates that investment in 4G mobile broadband networks already underway will add up to $151 billion in GDP growth over the next four years, creating 771,000 new jobs. So add construction jobs to the broadband power job creation I cataloged earlier. Since I became chairman, the FCC has taken a number of steps to promote innovation and investment in our broadband economy. In developing America's first national broadband plan, we set out a vision and an ambitious strategic agenda for seizing the opportunities of high-speed Internet, and ensuring U.S. leadership in the global broadband economy. Last year, we adopted a strong and balanced framework to preserve Internet freedom and openness. We said these widely supported rules of the road would increase certainty and predictability in the marketplace, unleashing new innovation and investment across the broadband economy. And as you've seen, they have. We've removed more than 50 unnecessary regulations and lifted needless restrictions on the use of spectrum, We streamlined the process of attaching broadband wires and wireless equipment to utility poles. We adopted a tower siting shot clock to speed mobile broadband deployment. We've advanced reforms to connect more schools, libraries, and hospitals to fast, affordable Internet and to increase the speed to market of health-related communications devices and apps. We've taken steps to empower consumers and promote competition. We've gotten a lot done, but there's more to do. In our country, we overwhelmingly rely on the private sector to build out our broadband infrastructure, and that's the right course. Government has a limited but essential role to play to facilitate private investment and innovation and ensure that infrastructure gaps are addressed. Government must efficiently utilize assets it controls or manages, like spectrum and rights of way. It must ensure that the programs it manages are fiscally responsible and meet the challenges of today, not the past. 
and it should take smart steps to promote broadband adoption and digital literacy, including by empowering consumers and promoting competition. Consistent with these principles, the FCC is pursuing an ambitious agenda to mobilize America, connect America, and empower America. We need to close four broadband gaps. First, we need to close the spectrum gap. Spectrum is, of course, the invisible infrastructure on which, on which mobile communications run. Demand for spectrum is rapidly outstripping supply. Smartphones are now the majority of phones being purchased, and that percentage is increasing at a rapid rate. Tablets are taking off. Compared to the standard phones we upgraded from not that long ago, the demand smartphones place on spectrum isn't double, it's not triple, it's 24 times more. For tablets, it's 120 times as much. Failure to free up more spectrum for mobile broadband will stifle mobile innovation and result in growing consumer frustration with congested networks and dropped connections. The spectrum crunch is the single biggest threat to one of the most promising parts of our economy. The Deloitte study that predicts the creation of 771,000 new jobs as a result of 4G deployment also warns, quote, insufficient spectrum could cause the U.S. to go from leader to laggard in the global competition to claim the benefits of 4G technology. 150 carriers in 60 countries have 4G deployment commitments, and if those countries overtake us, Deloitte's projected number of new 4G jobs would be cut in half or worse. There's much we need to do to free up spectrum for mobile broadband, but the single biggest step we can take is voluntary incentive auctions to reallocate spectrum from older uses to flexible mobile broadband. Under this proposal from the National Broadband Plan, spectrum licensees like broadcasters would voluntarily supply spectrum into an auction in exchange for a share of the proceeds from that auction. It's an incentive-based approach grounded in strong free market principles that would free up large blocks of beachfront spectrum for mobile broadband while preserving a strong and healthy TV business and generating $25 billion for taxpayers. This proposal enjoys broad and bipartisan support. Companies representing a trillion dollars in revenue have supported it from mobile to tech to consumer electronics. More than 110 of the nation's leading economists have endorsed it, including Nobel Prize winners and former members of both Republican and Democratic administrations. It's even been supported by a number of TV station owners who recognize that these auctions would be a win-win. It's exactly the kind of step Congress can take to help unleash investment, create jobs, and raise billions of dollars that could go both to deficit reduction and to fund the mobile broadband public safety network recommended by the 9-11 Commission that's still not built. Thanks to the commitment of Senators Rockefeller and Hutchison, this legislation was approved by the Senate Commerce Committee on a 21 to 4 bipartisan vote. But this bill still hasn't become a law. A spectrum crunch looms, and the costs of delay are significant and grow every day. The second broadband gap we need to close is the deployment gap. Right now, about 20 million Americans couldn't get broadband at home, even if they wanted to. Broadband infrastructure simply isn't available in their communities. We can't afford to have tens of millions of Americans left out of the broadband economy. That's why we're moving to modernize the Universal Service Fund for broadband. Last century, our country made a bold commitment to achieve universal access to the predominant communications technology of the time, analog telephone service. But now, subsidizing the past is standing in the way of advancing the future. Earlier this year, the FCC launched a proceeding to modernize this outdated program from telephone to broadband, transitioning wasteful spending to an efficient Connect America fund. The reforms we're pursuing would both boost the broadband economy by extending broadband, including mobile broadband, to unserved areas and meaningfully create jobs. We're in the home stretch of our process now with extensive focus and engagement by each of my colleagues on the commission. On the commission and a commitment to get this reform done. We're also committed to taking further steps to accelerate broadband build-out. Unnecessary regulations at the federal, state, and local levels can increase broadband construction costs by as much as 20% and slow down the build-out of these high-speed networks. 
I encourage Congress and the relevant federal and state transportation agencies to implement the dig once concept, laying broadband fiber and other infrastructure whenever there's road construction or repair. Congresswoman Eshoo has proposed legislation on this. Another concept that can pay dividends for our economy, deployment of ultra-high-speed networks as centers of information, intensive collaboration, and innovation. That's why our broadband plan called for one gigabit per second connections to at least one anchor institution in every American community. I was encouraged to see that more than 30 universities around the country recently formed a coalition called GIGU to accelerate the deployment of these super-fast networks to these university communities. It can be an important part of our national effort to close the broadband deployment gap. Third, we need to close the broadband adoption gap. Nearly 100 million Americans, almost one-third of our population, aren't signed up for broadband at home. That's about a 68% adoption rate. It's true across the country. It's true here in Washington, D.C. compares to a 90% adoption rate in, for example, South Korea or Singapore. Broadband adoption, as you all know, is increasingly necessary for participation in our economy. 80% of Fortune 500 companies now do all their job postings online and require online applications. Teachers want all their students to be able to access the Internet for homework or research papers. But over 50% of kids in low-income and minority communities don't have broadband at home. A high schooler from Florida wrote us that she did her homework by parking outside the local library at night and connecting to its Wi-Fi. We need a better solution for our students and for all the people who could benefit from the innovation and cost savings on the Internet around health care, energy, public safety. And we need to close not only the adoption gap, but the related broadband skills gap. Many tech positions, entry level and more advanced, are staying open for months on end. Even in this down economy, 63% of hiring managers say a talent shortage is the primary reason. Indeed.com is a company that aggregates online data about job listings. According to their data, there are 12 large metropolitan areas in which the ratio of job postings to unemployed people is one-to-one. -one. A job open for every person who's unemployed. These jobs aren't getting filled because too many job seekers don't have the right skills. As LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner wrote earlier this month, Fixing this imbalance and matching job openings with willing talent will go a long way toward restarting a virtuous cycle. When companies expand, they pay more taxes, consume more services, enabling other companies to expand, and open up opportunities for others to be promoted or hired. And as Jeff pointed out, while some unfilled jobs require engineering or extensive computer software expertise, many open positions require only basic digital skills, knowing how to use a computer how to search, how to process a basic internet transaction, basic digital literacy. Other jobs require skills or certifications that be, can be gotten online in a relatively short time, like training for entry-level positions in the healthcare industry or being certified in the use of Microsoft Office. Last week, with the FCC's engagement and support, two companies announced significant new programs to increase affordable access to broadband in the home and to digital skills training. I've challenged other service providers and companies across the broadband economy to step up and take concrete steps to promote broadband adoption, while also working with us on new approaches to existing programs that can and should be reformed to support broadband access. We need to tackle all of these challenges with a real sense of urgency because the costs of delay are significant and growing every day. If we mobilize America, connect America, and empower America, we'll grow our economy, and create new jobs, boosting confidence in our ability to compete and thrive in this changing world. Let me close with this. A powerful indicator of the growing significance of the tech sector to our broader economy came a few weeks ago when Apple surpassed ExxonMobil as the most valuable company in the world. Of course, in the mid-1990s, everyone thought Apple's best days were behind them. But not Steve Jobs. In an interview back then, he said, quote, the cure is to innovate our way out of our current predicament. Well, that's the right prescription for our country. Now's not the time to think small or look backward. We need to think build 
and build the future like we've always done. I've spoken today about the many ways in which that's already happening in the broadband economy. American entrepreneurs and innovators, small and large, inventing, investing, and creating new jobs and opportunity today. Let's build on these successes, accelerate them, and address the threats that could slow down our great American engine of innovation that requires smart policies to extend broadband infrastructure everywhere and to everyone, to seize the opportunities to expand our invisible infrastructure spectrum, and to empower U.S. entrepreneurs to out-innovate the world. We can do this. America can do this. Thank you.